jautājums. And uh, I invite Sadmi to Ozola to join us. I hope that you have already many questions prepared or comments. And while we are waiting for another colleague, I noted down some ideas. I wanted to read them out later, but uh, I have to use this moment when I have the mic. And these ideas that I, uh, no, I have noted down are as follows. First, in the very morning, it's good to be good. Evi Tagoša said, that it's economically um, profitable to be good and it's very important for businesses because businesses are not ready to spend one euro if they can't make two euros. So good is economically profitable. Another idea, the longest uh, road starts with the first step. You have to start with small changes to look at the current processes. Maybe you can uh, improve these processes by As communicator, I always like very slogans and ideas. So another idea that small things can achieve great results. So colleagues mentioned that maybe you should not focus on ambitious goals right away because there could be some minor things that can really change the situation. Another idea that what you do, what, uh, basically what you sell, that you get, and that should be taken into note. notice. And uh, now it's time for your questions, dear audience, because we have a complete uh, panel here. So when you ask your question, please introduce yourself and tell to whom you ask this question. And then we'll provide answers. So we have somebody raising hand. Thank you. I'll be the icebreaker. That's a liberty from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In December, we had a small seminar with the representative of the Polish National Contact Point, Jacqueline Kapuszak. Maybe you know about her. And she said that the due diligence directive, of course, we don't know what the fate will be, but the sustainability reporting directive has been adopted. And she said that the companies will not be able to meet these reporting requirements if they, in reality, will not perform the due diligence cycle. Do you agree with this opinion? To whom uh, are you asking this question? To all? Mostly to those panelists who have studied this directive, who know about it. Um, okay. uh, I, I do fully agree, um, because otherwise it's just compliance exercise. And you might perhaps kind of survive the first round of reports, because they do require comparison but um, of data, um, but in some areas not necessarily. But basically, already the second report will require you to compare. And if you don't implement the right processes, nothing will change. The things might go even for worse. So in your report, you will need to report on, you know, what is the trend. Are we uh, narrowing the gender pay gap? Do we have a smaller number of uh, accidents? And so on and so on. And if you don't improve, the investors and anybody who reads your reports will kind of know, okay, somebody is not addressing those issues at all. And this is a clear signal that the company is ignoring risks and that the company is not proactively mapping its human rights impacts and it's not mapping the human rights related risk. And that's really not a good um, kind of future for telling for, for, for the company. So I do fully agree. And additionally, we don't necessarily, we don't only have CSRD as of this reporting directive, but we also do have green taxonomy where we do have minimum safeguards which refer you back to UNGPs and OECD guidelines. And basically, if you want to have, to put it very kind of in a simple way, if you want, want to have a better access on better conditions to financing, you better meet those minimal safeguards. So again, you have to implement due diligence. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, obviously, you are not obliged to. You are not obliged to be a sustainable company, mm -hmm. but then obviously, um, as a result, you just will have worse um, conditions when it comes to access to capital. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just to add yep. on to to that, um, I think that there was a, an appreciation that the old non-financial reporting directive and that regime just wasn't meeting the information needs of, of users, and I think that was why there's been this reform, and why that <clears throat> it was, it was recognised to be necessary not just to create a new directive, but to create a set of really quite granular reporting standards that companies are required to use, to, for exactly the reason that Beata highlights, so that you can actually know what the company is, is reporting against and kind of compare it over time in a way that you couldn't really with old sustainability reports because companies were using, uh, afforded a lot of flexibility in the way that they reported in different kind of structures, what issues that they chose to report on, that sort of thing. Um, I should say as well that the, um, the CSRD and the ESRS that sort of are linked to it, the reporting standards, go a lot further than what was contemplated in the CSDD by way of due diligence. Um, one example is that it requires under the sort of the social component reporting um, to report um, on impacts against you know, own, own workforce, workers in the value chain, communities and consumers. So this requires you know, a consideration of impacts that you have on all of these stakeholder groups, uh, which requires thinking about you know, how the, the use of your products and services might impact kind of consumers and communities, which goes a bit further than the due diligence requirement under the CSDD, but is very much aligned with what's expected under the UNGPs. So I would say that the sort of, um, I think very difficult to conduct due diligence, uh, sorry, very difficult to report on the due diligence you conduct if you haven't conducted it, because there are specific requirements to, to report on your due diligence processes um, under, the, under the directive and the reporting standards. Um, but um, in any event, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I think that it's an absolutely essential component to do due diligence to underlie their reporting. Yeah. I can just uh, echo that as a company uh, fresh out of the reporting season mm -hmm. <laughs> as we speak uh, and now aligning our reporting to the CSRD and ESRS uh, standards. Our report would be this thin on the social element mm -hmm. if we had not conducted human mm -hmm. rights due diligence for exactly mm -hmm. the point that's been made here. Mm -hmm. We have to report on impacts for our own workforce, value chain, uh, communities, et cetera, and, and uh, users. So it's just uh, essential, regardless mm -hmm. of the CSDD mm -hmm. legislation. Yeah. Yeah, if I can add to that, I think that um, I, I think that the CSRD could serve as a driver for uh, the CSDD for performing due diligence, but it depends on whether how much the company faces investor or consumer or other scrutiny. I think there are some companies that may try to work their way and are working their way through the detailed reporting requirements without doing effective due diligence because they aren't, they aren't facing that kind of scrutiny, and so the CSDD will bring that pressure to those companies that may not be as visible, may not be in the retail space mm -hmm. or have a, a consumer facing business. Okay, H hello, my name is Aya Bank. I represent the consultant side of the, of the audience, obviously, and no, I don't have a lot of experience in, in these questions, and we do not, uh, uh, also, we do not say that we have, like, you know, 20 years of experience. I do have a question. Uh, first of all, I want to th uh, say thank you to all the panelists, actually, very, very practical points you raised, and, and it was very interesting. I do I do have a question, if I may, to Lisa, because you mentioned that you have performed this impact uh, assessments, and my question is that we, we receive a lot of questions um, from the companies who are, you know, taking the first steps in, in, in this uh, area, and they actually are interested, interested in very, like, practical aspects, like, how far we should go. For example, maybe you can give like shortly just uh, the, the insight how you worked with those uh, consultants who, who performed this impact assessment. What was your, 
I don't know, focus. How far did you go? Uh, I mean, because, you know, there are some companies which have like a very long supplier chain due to the just type of the business. Like, for example, I don't know, the factory which is making cookies have like a, a long list of, uh, of uh, uh, sugar. Uh, I mean, the, the companies who will supply the sugar and sometimes it's not even the... Um, you know, they have like agent, agent, and agent, and uh, usually companies are interested to understand, okay, how far we are looking for the risks. I mean, sometimes it's just not possible to identify the, you know, the very, very end supplier, for example. So what, what was your sort of uh, approach to that? Thank yeah, thank you. you. Uh, I think that's a very good question, and... Uh complicated answer is perhaps that I think there are many ways to, to go about this. For us, the starting point was to do a, a country human rights risk assessment. So look at where are we, um, where do we have operations, what type of activities, how many employees, etc., and then looking at country human rights risk indices. And that gave us a list of countries um, to do a deep dive human rights impact assessment. So we did it at country level as our starting point, mm -hmm. focusing on our site of operation, the local community surrounding our sites, mm -hmm. uh, logistics to and from <coughs> our sites, transportation companies, for instance, third-party run warehouses that were connected to our site. But there are um, other ways to go about this. I mean, I'm sure you could elaborate, but you could do a topic-specific human rights impact assessment instead of doing country-based. Mm -hmm. So that's something, I mean, the companies could discuss with the consultancy that they would like to do this. Like we've identified that this stream or this industry or this product is high risk. Uh, this is where we would like to dig. And then they could probably assist in terms of how far to go down the supply chain. Yeah, maybe I could supplement with a couple of other examples of different kinds of human rights impact assessments that we've been involved in uh, at the Danish Institute. Again, it very much depends on what you're assessing because you need to sort of, um, as Lisa says, you sort of do a scoping mission essentially to figure out where your sites of risk are and therefore how to scope the HRA itself. Um, so, for example, um, we've done some that have been, uh, we did one for L'Oreal uh, um, a few years ago where we looked at citrus production in southern Italy. So that was a kind of a regional assessment where we looked at a number of different farms producing citrus and the, the, the kind of um, and the impacts that were occurring around there, and uh, you know, that also involved a bit of consideration of, of supply chains, but it was mainly around the sites. We've also done um, full value chain human rights impact assessments uh, in the Thai context. So there, we were engaged by by Record, a health and hygiene brand, to do. Uh, full value chain assessments on two of their product lines, condoms and infant formula, in the Thai context, because that was a good candidate for that. Because um, you know, in the instance of condom production, the, sort of the latex was tapped, um, you know, in the in in Thailand, it was produced in Thailand and then um, marketed and retailed as well. So you can see, um, you can trace the entire value chain of the product in the context. So you can do um, impact assessments that do that that full value chain assessment. Um, as to what will be the kind of the primary side of risk, if you're sort of looking at you know, sugar supply chains and, and numerous suppliers, it will very much depend on, I think, the initial scoping of the HRAA to figure out where the sites of risk are likely to be. Um, I think that you often hear about like full value chain kind of mapping and, and traceability, and I think that that can be a really useful tool to incorporate but not at the expense of diverting resources to that exercise away from actually um, actions that you might take to address the impacts you're finding. I think that there's often a sort of quite a slavish insistence on kind of full value chain mapping going all the way and looking at every single item in the value chain. But if that's not being done with an eye to a risk-based approach to identify kind of where your most, most likely kind of sites of risk are going to be, then you're devoting a lot of resources to doing this kind of transparency exercise but not actually thinking about how you're going to address the impacts you find there. So I think that's another kind of tension to, to explore maybe. It's more about um, this sort of risk-based approach than it is about how, exactly how far you go into the supply chain. Well, God, the time, Luzo. Any more questions? So let's use the moment. Uh, we have experts just a few steps away. Hello, um, my name is Gottes Flinters. I'm a lawyer working uh, for a law firm Cobalt. 
So thank you, first of all, about the um, insights into due diligence uh, exercises. And I think what, what uh, is the topic for me is the difference between tick the box exercise and uh, doing it meaningful. Mm. And we've uh, met quite a lot of uh, companies and uh, professionals who have been onboarded with a specific organization and then are sort of confronted with a situation where they face a management which is not fully on board. So uh, what is your advice to such young professionals who c encounter this situation? How do you communicate with the management? How do you keep them on board? Thank you. You should tackle this. Well, I guess I can uh, give it a go. I, I would say at Yara, we are quite fortunate though because we have a, a general executive management that is very passionate about this topic. But I must say that um, I think their passion and engagement around this followed uh, doing a few of these human rights impact assessments, taking pictures, showing what the stakeholders on the ground had actually reported and said. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of being able to um, to portray kind of, you know, this is what's happening on a Yara site on the ground. And that made it very tangible, I think, for them as well. Um, so I think that's a very uh, specific example, uh, and as has been mentioned here as well, involving several departments and making it sort of concrete, specific, not just talking about the human rights as an umbrella topic, but what does it actually mean? Go ahead. Um, actually, I wanted to add on what you said, that you have to make it very context specific. I mean, if we are asked to support a company, we usually tend to ask, if possible, for a call for like one hour workshop meeting with somebody from the board who will be responsible for human rights issues as part of ESG or as some under other heading. But um, I mean, in a way, it's a little bit easier with some of the legislation in the region because um, if you kind of start to point that if you want to have some extra points in indexes for having the right human rights policy, well, you'll get those extra 5% uh, in point from corporate human rights benchmark if you have somebody from the board indicated and you, you have some sort of board oversight. So you better, I mean, they have to decide at some stage who will be taking, taking it on and who will be bringing it to the board. So that's one of our kind of entry points, how we try to argue for having a discussion with the board. Uh, again, making it very context-specific, recently we were talking to a company which uh, likely was quite high level um, when it comes to the group and where I was actually shocked to see that they haven't realized that they are um, kind of building a factory in a specific country might actually not be such a good idea due to geopolitical reasons. And um, it was very clear through questions. So if you kind of try to link it up with something which is probably very tangible business case, uh, this probably would, uh, would help to drive it through. And just to say, one of the things that we've met was like uh, when we kind of present this code, like what are the human rights, we very often get question like, uh, or rather a statement that, okay, there are so many of those human rights. We'll f let's, let's choose three and we'll focus on those. So that's not the way to do it. So that's another challenge. But um, I don't know if you... Yeah, I wanted to add, add to that. Yeah, we worked with a number of companies for even even... I think well-intentioned companies may have some doubters within the C-suite. Um, and to work with those companies, you have to, I think, um, approach it in, in one of two ways. One is to force the company to make a strategic decision. Is this going to be a core commitment of the company? And to build capacity and training, even at the C senior level, to make sure everyone understands what the what's required, but then also build the internal control environment. There are still a lot of directors who are afraid of liability. I think that was one of the sticking issues with the CSDDD. Um, our director is going to be liable, and they're afraid of. I think, understandably so, that they may take steps that enhance shareholder value, but then they're accused of not fulfilling their obligations to conduct or manage human rights risk, conduct human rights due diligence. And so also building a strong internal control environment 
defining accountabilities, assuring them that there will, depending on the severity of the risk, that there will be uh, people within the company who are responsible for addressing and mitigating and managing that risk all the way up the chain and not just at the director level. One thing to the end of that, that, that um, there are quite a lot of good resources out there for kind of um, making the case to, to management and kind of and board level discussions. Um, we can share maybe a few links to those resources um, with the participants here as well today that might be useful. Um, that they have some sort of good tangible advice, and I think that you know I think that we've covered off a lot, quite a lot of those um, from the panelists already. But yeah, I think it's a matter of kind of finding the hook. I guess what's got, what's going to kind of work. Um, with with management, whether that be kind of linking it to geopolitical events or kind of liability risk exposure, legal developments, I think all of those can be good drivers. Um, but I, but again, there are some there are some good kind of um, resources out there, so we can um, maybe share like um, some of the resources afterwards. If I could just ask one, add one one element, uh, we are focusing here on pillar two, but we are all aware, and I'm from NGO. And also when Jules are aware that there are a number of contradictions in national laws. Like you said, that um, you know, they might be accused of raising the shareholder value, but at the same time not driving through on the sustainability. We do have the issue in Poland with the law that uh, the Polish um, commercial code just basically prioritizes shareholder value mm -hmm. and undertaking some actions in the lack of necessary legislation might be tricky. Mm. So I would just uh, say talk to your uh, business associations because this is one of the issues which you mm. should be raising with the national government. Pointing, like you want us to be more responsible. You want us to assist with the green transition. You want us to make sure that the green transition is a just transition. Well, do change the law because at the moment those provisions are making it impossible. So that's also the role for the business mm. associations. Thank yeah. I had one just reflection on the discussion in the panel and in also in relation to the question here, which is, you know, our starting point in a certain sense is, you know, how to hold corporations accountable for their impacts uh, on environment and in particular on also human environment and human rights and so on. And that means having mechanisms for, for yeah, uh, identifying issues and control and, and, and so on. Um, when I listened to the presentations, I was struck by the fact that all of you, I think, in your presentations gravitated towards how this is also beneficial for businesses, right? You were sort of gravitating towards how you, in fact, enhance uh, workplace cultures, uh, stakeholder relations, consumer relations, uh, brand image, and, and many other issues, you know, that there is this kind of... Uh, Intrinsic motivator is not just the stick coming from outside. It's also the the in, internal uh, incentive, and I think that is part of the answer. You know, it's not something mm -hmm. that will come happen overnight, but it's very mm -hmm. important to accentuate how developing good business practices are good business practices are good for society, but also for businesses themselves. And that's why I asked the question about leveling level playing field as well. You know, because it's about developing some form of of positive momentum in this direction, which could really be a win-win scenario, in ideally speaking. And that doesn't mean there won't be cases where we really have to go after the malpractice, you know, and that, that is obviously also part of the, the bigger picture. But, but I think that's been a very important message coming from all of you in the panel, in fact, you know, that there is something really to be gained for businesses by engaging this. It's overwhelming and daunting at first because the requirements seem big, and I think also the issue, the technical issues, how do you handle uh, supply chain uh, impact assessments and, and, and so on. And this is, again, it's a learning process. But I think the, the, to maintain also the focus on the intrinsic benefits to businesses is, is an important part of the message. And I, I've, I felt everyone was, was sharing that also, you know. I was hoping there is comment actually of Samit Kun. Maybe the last comment. Um, yes, uh, I add to what uh, the previous speaker said. If the country, if the state uh, do not uh, provide those uh, mechanisms, we have to understand that uh, this environment wouldn't change. If it was profitable in the past uh, and some changes have to be made, there has to be some sanctions. I'm sorry, but some sanctions against those who are against the changes. And at the same time, there has to be also support to those 
who are for changes. Like my colleague said, uh, there is, um, inter uh, if there is interest in uh, the company boards and uh, managers uh, in, in those issues, and I, 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 I could agree that this is the uh, same here. Uh, we see that there is an interest and there is a support, but the story is um, if um, how can you demand something from others if you don't have those instruments? I believe that um, our discussion, we had a discussion and all of us got valuable ideas. And there is a saying that the worst answers are the ones that are not, that are said to the question that is not asked. So let us uh, use um, this uh, opportunity, which is uh, conclusion and networking, which is the most valuable part. So in the networking part, which will be organized at the same place where the coffee break was, use this individual opportunity to ask to your experts what they specifically did or didn't do and what are other uh, special conclusions. And, uh, and uh, we had some common conclusions that all of us heard, but you can ask them and get your personal conclusions. So thank you to, thank you to the experts uh, that they agreed to share their experience. Thank you to the organizers of the event. Thank you to the cooperation partners without whom it wouldn't be possible. And also those who in, in some time want to, to get some conclusions from this event. First of all, remember that there is a site on the internet, ombudsman.lv, and the materials uh, presentations of this conference will be available there. And um, also the materials that are on the screen during the coffee break, they will be available there as well on our website. And in, in some time, the video also will be available available on our web page. So there will be this material, you can use it and we'll be happy if it's useful. And I hope that uh, you leave this place with two conclusions, two valuable ideas. So see you at the networking event. Thank you.